Good morning. I'm delighted to see so many faces who were here last night, back here this morning. Uh, again, many uh, folks literally from all around the world, from virtually every time zone, including 12 hours away. So I appreciate uh, already the energy that's in this room. We're going to try to sustain it for the entire day. Uh, to get us started, I want to first uh, 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 ask uh, my dean of the College of Social Science and Humanity, Uta Poiser, to give us some welcome remarks. I'll have to say the Global Resilience Institute, and therefore this derivative event, would not be possible without her support. So Uta, thank you for that, and, and welcome, the, have you do the welcoming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to Boston and to Northeastern University for this momentous occasion, if we can call it that. Uh, the inaugural summit of the Global Resilience Research Network brings together many of the world's leading universities and researchers who share a common commitment to discover and nurture ways for individuals, for communities, to become more resilient and to pay much attention to both the natural and the built environment in that process. We all know that we are in an age of global turbulence and in that age resilience is a particularly important concept for us. Northeastern is really honored to host this summit and I'm particularly excited to have this opportunity to welcome you. It was just 15 short months ago that we launched the Global Resilience Institute under the exceptional leadership of Steve Flynn as a university-wide research enterprise. And during this summit, you are engaging with the members of the excellent team, from students to senior fellows to faculty to staff, that Steve has put together. The resilience focus ties together many of Northeastern's traditions and ambitions as articulated in our academic plan, Northeastern 2025. It ties together the university's areas of focus on security, sustainability, and health. And of course, the focus on resilience, very importantly, also has us conceiving partnerships between academia, between academia and the public and private sectors. In other words, the term and the concept of resilience allows us to do the best work that we can do in academia, as well as with all our partners. And of course, international partners are absolutely key to the success of this work. I also would just like you to take a moment um, to soak in our surroundings. We are very pleased at Northeastern to be in the center of one of the world's cities, Boston. I hope you have a chance at some point to perhaps walk around the campus. We are here at the eastern edge of the campus. We are very pleased to have a pretty compact campus in the center of the city. And at the same time, let me also just take this opportunity to tell you a few words in a few words about Northeastern and its ambitions. Northeastern is a very ambitious research university that at the same time is built on an unusual educational model. And that is a model that is built on experiential learning. We really bring experiential learning through all our educational and research offerings, from the undergraduate level to the master's level to the PhD level. This combination of research excellence and this deep commitment to engagement and experiential learning have made us very competitive. So for example, for our incoming freshman class of 2,800 students this fall, we had an applicant pool, an international applicant pool of 62,000 students. We are, in other words, very proud of the kind of work that we can do engaging outside of the university, and that is always really key to our mission, and in many ways what the Global Resilience Institute and what the Global Resilience Research Network represent is really what I see as the future of higher education. Higher education as a meeting point for collaborations between the private and the public sector, and with a serious research and engagement mission as well. When you look around, you also visually are reminded that we, of course, are surrounded by very diverse communities here in Boston, and I'm sure that is true for all of you who are coming to us from all over the world, from Asia, from the Middle East, from Europe, from South and Latin America. You see in this direction, for example, 
economically disadvantaged communities. You see a financial center in this direction. Again, engagement around questions of resilience with the diverse communities of Boston is very important to the global resilience effort, to the effort of Northeastern. And again, we very much look forward to learning from one another what we can do in this resilient space. But the ambition of the network is not just learning from one another. The ambition of the network is really also to foster research collaboration so research collaborations that we hope will engage students, will engage partners, will engage um, faculty members, will engage uh, staff. And to that end, Northeastern, under the leadership of Dan Cohen, who I see somewhere here in the audience, there he is, the dean of our libraries, has built uh, a system that uh, through technology should help us, in fact, build resilience where technology is part of the picture of, of what creates this need for greater resilience at the same time. So we are really hoping to use technology and the uh, opportunities that um, technology will provide us in networking in order to mitigate against disaster and in order to build resilience in this world. So I very much look forward to seeing how this technology will help us. Of course, it will never replace the kinds of in person meetings that we are fortunate to have today. And I wish all of you a very successful summit. And um, again, it's just a real pleasure to welcome you to Boston and to Northeastern University. Thank you. It is then my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Frank Trapper. From Frank Trapper comes to us from the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Munich. And um, as you know, Fraunhofer is Euro one of Europe's or leading and certainly Europe's largest application-oriented research organization. And given what I've just told you about the ambitions of Northeastern University, you can imagine that we are very thrilled that the Global Resilience Institute from its inception has been closely tied with one of the Fraunhofer Institutes, with Fraunhofer EMI in Freiburg. Frank Treppe is the Director of Corporate Strategy and International Affairs and a member of the board of the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. He graduated from the Technical University Aachen, Germany in mechanical engineering. And again, that's probably something that I should stress. Resilience is so much about multidisciplinarity. You hear right now a historian talking. Next, you will hear an, an engineer talking before you heard a political scientist talking. That is really part of the excitement and part of what resilience enabled. Back to Herr Treppe. His professional career started at the Fraunhofer Institute for Production Technology, and today he is in charge of Fraunhofer's international strategic business and research development. Moreover, he has a wide range of domestic and international responsibilities that reach to the United States, Chile, Austria, uh, Austria and Sweden. And he also serves as chairman, um, no, as president of the European Association of Research and Technology Organizations and as an evaluator in the technology programs of the European Commission. We are delighted that Fraunhofer is joining us um, here today, and so please give a hand to Frank Treppe. So now it's up to the engineer to welcome all of you. <laughs> Dear Professor Peuger, Dear Professor Flynn, dear Mr. Hiller, Mr. Albrecht Brömme, President of THW, the German Technical Assistance Organization, and dear Dr. Miriam Haritz, Head of the Crisis Management Federal Office for Citizen Protection and Disaster Support. Dear participants of the first and hopefully annual summit, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. As a director of, for international affairs and research programs of, at the headquarters of Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Munich, and also as president of the European Association of Research and Technology Organizations based in Brussels, I'm very pleased to be here today and to introduce my colleagues from Fraunhofer EMI, our Institute for High Speed Dynamics, which has been partnering with Northeastern University for quite some time. 
Unfortunately, I have good and less good news uh, this morning. The less uh, good one is that Professor Stefan Hiermeyer, who is one of the drivers behind this cooperation, needed to be taken to hospital um, over the weekend and unfortunately was not able to come here um, to Boston. He would have loved to be here, uh, has been instrumental in co-organizing this, and he very much regrets his absence due to illness and asked me to convey his warmest regards, and we all wish him that he will recover fast. The good news is I'm glad to introduce um, Professor Hiermeyer, instead of uh, Professor Hiermeyer, Mr. Daniel Hiller from Fraunhofer EMI. Daniel is fully up to date with the relationship between Fraunhofer and Northeastern University and will substitute Stefan in giving his introductory remarks. But before we start, let me give you again a very brief glimpse into Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer, as you heard, is Europe's largest application-oriented research organization with over 70 institutes in Germany, some 16 research centers outside of Germany, actually two here in Boston, and more than 25,000 employees. Our research efforts are geared entirely toward to people's needs and focus on health, security, communication, energy, and the environment. As a result, the work undertaken by our researchers and developers has a significant impact on people's lives. The future will most likely be marked by a growing degree of turbulence, which translates into a need to advance resilience that will allow societies to not just survive, but to thrive, as the title of this summit also underscores. We observe these developments in Germany as well as in Europe. To meet these challenges, Fraunhofer tries to team up with the best researchers worldwide, and our institutes always closely cooperate with excellent partners in academia. The trustful relationship between Fraunhofer EMI and uh, Northeastern University, which was established in 2012, and its recently founded Global Resilience Research Network is just one of the best examples for such a very fruitful collaboration. Our institute, EMI, ranks among the key players in European security research and has helped to establish resilience as a topic on both the national as well as the European level of security research. <laughs> Together with the local University of Freiburg, Fraunhofer EMI created a Department of Sustainable Systems Engineering Research on Resilience from an engineering point of view, short words, resilience engineering, is one of the major topics of this department. Professor Stefan Hiermeyer, who is directing Fraunhofer EMI, is one of the world's leaders in sustainable systems and resilience engineering, and Fraunhofer is fortunate to have such an expert. Please let me now introduce briefly uh, Daniel Hiller. Daniel is the Director of Strategy and International Partnerships of the Fraunhofer Institute for High Speed Dynamics and one of Stefan Hiermeyer's closest collaborators. Daniel joined Fraunhofer in 2009 and in the beginning served as the Managing Director of the Fraunhofer Group for Defense and Security Research. In that role, he managed the political network and engaged with key stakeholders in both the civil and the military domains. Before joining Fraunhofer, Daniel served in the Market Research Competitive Intelligence Department of Rheinmetall Defense, so he also has a lot of market background. As part of his graduate program, Daniel resumed various functions at the German Council on Foreign Affairs the Washington DC branch of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, as well as the Office of the Chief of Staff of the Majority Speaker of the German Bundestag. On behalf of Stefan Hiermeyer, Daniel Hiller, and their colleagues, we congratulate you, Steve, and your fantastic team for having successfully gathered this audience for your first annual Global Resilience Research Network Summit. We are very proud to be part of this conference. And Fraunhofer is looking forward to seeing this network grow and be successful in advancing resilience on multiple scales. Ladies and gentlemen, now please join me in a warm applause to welcoming Daniel, who will give some further introductory remarks.
Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Frank, for this kind introduction. Distinguished guests from around the globe, I'm really delighted to stand up here representing my institute, Fraunhofer EMI, as one of the founding members of this network. And I'm especially proud and honored, I have to say, to do this together with you, Steve, friend and comrade, I have to say, and your fantastic team of GRI here in Boston. We all have traveled here to attend a summit. And I think, actually, for all of you, or for most of you, this is a kickoff, a beginning, a first event. Yet for Steve, and especially his team, we all know that in very literal terms, climbing a summit and climbing up to this summit, enabling all of us to fully use these two days in a mind-stimulating environment, as we can see here, was quite a workout for all of you and your team. And I'm just going to speak in the name, actually, of all involved partners here in the room um, to say a big thank you, Steve, and thank you, Angie, and, all, and your team for your leadership in standing up this initiative, um, which is highly valuable to all of us. Thank you. Now, before Steve will lay out the land more thoroughly in a second, I would like to kick off this morning with two very short personal stories that I think actually relate to both how we as an organization work in the field of resilience and how we are convinced we must tackle resilience as global teams holistically as you all are here in the room as organizations. Let me introduce you to two very interesting persons. Over here, we have Gottlieb. What a surprise, a German. Father of six, gets an education as a gunsmith, and later becomes another surprise, an engineer. Gottlieb is a guy with a, with a vision, and Gottlieb is an industrious inventor who soon finds collaborators who believe in both his vision about a certain future and the technological solutions that Gottlieb believes in will shape this future. On his path, though, Gottlieb runs into many challenges slash barriers, and we will hear more about barriers today. No clear business model yet, no solid investors, business partners giving up on him and his ideas. There is no such thing yet as market pull or regulation that would help his innovation or invention to become a breakthrough success. Not yet. Then we have Joseph here on the other side. Joseph is a brilliant scientist and works days and nights to advance his studies in physics. He's not satisfied to publicize his findings nor does he rest on scientific credentials and entitlements. Joseph also becomes an optometrist and tries to apply his scientific findings in his practical work and soon starting a business manufacturing telescopes. So from being a scientist and researcher, he becomes a passionate innovator and a businessman achieving market success. Now, how do these two stories of the two gentlemen align with the theme of this summit? Well, I will give away a surprise. Gottlieb, his last name is Daimler. And we all know what his inventions finally led to. Is a great example of overcoming multiple barriers, different barriers in terms of interdisciplinary work, in terms of technical, regulatory, and societal barriers to achieve a bigger vision. By the way, at one point, one of the investors let him down, an Austrian guy called Jelinek, and he had to persuade him to again give him some money to continue his work, and he promised him he would name his latest vehicle invention like his daughter. Does anybody know who the daughter of Mr. Jelinek's name is? Mercedes, thank you very much. And I'm not joking. Joseph, on the other hand, his last name is Fraunhofer. Yes, we carry his name and we carry his tradition. Because our DNA, and I said this at the outset of GRI, Steve, I think the DNA of Northeastern and the thinking of Northeastern and GRI fully aligns with the DNA of what Joseph von Fraunhofer and his legacy have basically left us. It's all about taking great ideas and solutions from basic science and translate them into real world solutions to serve a greater good for our society, and as Frank has mentioned, the industry. 
in very practical terms, that means that, for instance, today's decision makers at Daimler, Bosch, Siemens, you name them, approach us and ask us for help in solving resilience-related challenges they're facing. Of course, similar to here in the US, the key developments in the moment, the big topics, the big challenges like digitization of our industries, autonomous driving, blockchain, a lot of developments that have a lot of resilience issues tied to them that are still unresolved. The key question we have to help these industries to answer is, how can we best utilize the opportunities that come with these developments for our businesses and services without increasing the risk and the vulnerability of our systems to collapse and break when they face major disruption? Yes, we still have a lot of work, both in academia and research, to successfully address these complex challenges properly. We need to demonstrate that we can come up with methods and tools to understand things such as the interdependency and the criticality of infrastructure networks and systems. To achieve that, yes, we need a lot of bright science and multiple disciplines. Aside from that, though, and that's what I want to conclude with is, what I'm also convinced is we need a good portion of such things as creativity, flexibility, adaptivity, and also various, are also very essential elements of resilience. On my flight to Boston, I actually read a nice little piece, a booklet, quite small. I, I'm more than happy to share it with you. It's a promising title. It says, Ready for Anything, Designing Resilience for a Transforming World ready for anything. I think that sounds good, both for this day and this whole endeavor. We're up here all together. Um, now, what's the magical recipe to achieve this? Actually, it's quite simple. The author suggests to apply gaming methods in all varieties in order to produce creative ideas on how to think the unthinkable, how to understand the interdependence of lifeline systems in a major disaster by applying gaming methods. Don't worry. We're not going to change the program. No game day today, Steve, right? We're going to follow through the program. But very interesting approach. We've gathered here in this room today bright minds and ideas from academia, from research, but I'm also happy to see a lot of representatives of the private sector, of the government sector, practitioners who own and operate our lifeline infrastructure systems, but also those who manage the response and the recovery when disruption hits. Given this audience, I'm absolutely convinced that today's and tomorrow's discussions will strongly enrich and advance our joint efforts towards new powerful resilience concepts and practical solutions on a global scale. Once again, thank you all for coming here from close and very far away. I know we're all fighting the jet lag still a little bit, at least we are. And it's now my big pleasure and my honor to pass over to my friend and comrade, Steve Flynn. Please welcome Steve. Well, good morning. I just really want to set a couple of tones here for our day and do it very briefly. One is why this is so urgent that we take this on, uh, this effort of building resilience at the individual, at the community, at the system, and ultimately societal level. And a bit of a how we're going to go about doing this. Can we put up my one slide uh, here? Do we have that? This, I think, is what is animating the need for resilience. Why I think literally you've come around the world and you're dealing with this both locally, but we recognize we need globally. It's just one visual representation of what we're up against, which is essentially the challenges associated with being hyper-connected. As we become more connected, the risk is that we also become more interdependent and dependent on each other, and that has real benefits, as we know. And what's animated each one of those connections is because somebody identified a benefit for making that link. But as we build those networks and as they continue to intertwine with each other, when we have a shock, it's far more disruptive than it would have been under older circumstances. This, I think, for broad publics, is increasingly creating a source of anxiety. Things are unfolding in ways that they are, don't know how it will work out. And in that culture of anxiety, we have real risk that we lose our sense of optimism as a people, of how we can take on these challenges. We're in a race to sort of restore the sense that we can live with risk. 
that risk is natural and that we have the means to actually manage that risk in ways that are productive, that in fact are inventive and innovative. But if we don't get out in front of this, the challenge of greater connectivity could work against us. And so I think what should be animating so much of the work at the individual, at the community, at the systems of network societal levels is how do we tackle this challenge of getting all the benefits of connectedness without its downsides? And the race is on because we've gotten more connected quicker than we have thought about how we deal with some of the inherent risks that go with those connections. Somewhat ironically, the solution is networking. <laughs> and that's what we're launching here in part today. It is in that race of trying to get a handle on it, there's no single place, there's no certainly single discipline that can give us the answers to how we tackle this. Because of the urgency, we have to scale whatever we do very, very quickly. We can't afford to have, hey, we'll hang and investigate this in the next 20 years and give you a good idea. This race is on, and we have to figure out how we actually accelerate the solutions and scale it globally. So that's natural, it seems to me, that we would want to pull folks who are literally working these problems around the world and figure out how we can work together collaboratively through a network, through actually some of the tools of technology we'll be sharing with you as a way to deal with each other virtually when we can't get together in a beautiful venue like this on a day like today. That's what our purpose is. My goal for this summit, I hope, and I hope you all share this, is that when we leave here on Friday, there are some collaborative relationships to tackle some real problems identified by some of our practitioner speakers today that we're gonna roll up our sleeves and work. And we're gonna start bringing people into that effort. And this thing is gonna grow and it's gonna make a powerful difference in making our world more resilient, more prosperous, and thriving, not just surviving, in the face of this kind of risk. All right, so that's the, what our agenda is. Now, one of the things, the way we've shaped the program today, we're gonna to quickly transition into what should be animating our work as researchers is the real practical challenges that people who essentially been on the front lines of managing some big disruptions, some big shocks that we'll focus on, but we also know the slower moving shocks, things like, what is artificial intelligence going to do to disrupt the workforce? Climate as a longer term issue doesn't have many times an immediate shock value. We have to wrestle with both the slow moving disruptive events as well as the ones that are really quite dramatic. But what we wanted to bring together here to set the tone is the folks who are literally been on the front lines of managing these risks, managing the response, managing the recovery to give us some insights garnered from being in those crosshairs. And I think that will hopefully help animate our going forward. Our effort this afternoon is really to deal with not, okay, here are all the solutions out there, because while there are some real solutions, and many people here are architects of some of the most brilliant, innovative ideas of how we tackle some aspect of resilience, the nature of this enterprise is really to sort of bound what it is that we should be trying to accomplish. And what I thought is a useful construct, it's what's animating our approach here at Northeastern University with the Global Resilience Institute, is rather than focus on initially sort of saying, well, this will make us resilient and we should do this or that, is actually start with the recognition that we have barriers to becoming resilient. That I've yet to find, and I've talked to a lot of audiences around the world, where I find people who are anti-resilient. <laughs> They're basically for fragility and brittleness. <laughs> Give me more of that. It's not that people, once they know what it is, and most people intuitively know what it is, that's the intuitive that from psychologists tell us. We know a person who's faced trauma, who overcome that trauma, that they know what we recognize, that some quality of resilience is there and we admire it, right? We honor it often. That we know if we could somehow bottle that and expand it more broadly, that would be a good thing. So that's what very powerful this concept of resilience has. It's, it's, it's intuitive almost to our DNA that that's something worth going. But what's keeping us from becoming resilient? And we basically bundled what we have the barriers here for what we're focusing on and asking our distinguished researchers from around the world to help us understand. The first barrier is risk, what I say is risk illiteracy. Right? We're not going to know what to be resilient if we don't understand the hazards that are coming at us, and very importantly, how the hazards will play out on things that we value. So that's a really interesting and challenging, largely science problem. But then, once we understand it, we have to spread that understanding, and that's where education comes in. So we've got to figure, if we're going to tackle this, we've got to be, how do we raise risk literacy, and how do we propagate it through education? The second barrier is we don't design for resilience. We design for efficiency. That's what got all these networks to come together. We design for safety, use it because we're told to. <laughs> that government is regulated or somebody's required it. 
But we don't design for things to not just withstand, but also to degrade gracefully, to have a built-in regenerative quality to bounce back better and stronger. It's a really interesting and challenging engineering design problem at the macro level, regional planning, urban planning, at the micro level, it's at the asset level. That's a challenge. So how do we get our arms around that? Great, now we have understanding, we have design, Nobody's gonna do a darn thing because there's no incentive for them to adopt those designs and scale it. And so understanding what the incentives issue that we need to harness in order to get these things to scale is key. And finally, governance. We're not organized to do this. We're organized in jurisdictions. We're organized around sectors. We're organized around a 20th century model that things were just all pieces that you could manage and when we integrated them all. So thinking about governance is really key. All right, so our framing here today is not to say here's expertise about, it's really to draw on the leading experts from around the world to help us understand what are the challenges in each of those buckets of areas to overcome that this community ideally will engage around to make a real difference, to actually advance resilience. At its core though we know is that can't be done in isolation. The same people who are talking about incentives should be talking to the people who are thinking about design, who should be the same people who understand risk, who are the same people who have to organize and set the governance for accomplishing that. And we will really do magic if we can find a way in which we integrate those insights as a part of how we pursue this imperative. Okay. So that modest task <laughs> is what we're up to here. You're all on board today, and I hope this is really gonna be the launch. You know, the challenge of the summit is you sometimes descend, okay? The key here is there are actually are a mountain range ahead of us here, and there's lots of the summits we're gonna to get toward that are higher than where we are right now. But I'm so thrilled to be on top of this wonderful facility, looking over the city of Boston, and have so many friends and uh, comrades and colleagues from around the world who are all sharing the passion for this mission. Mm -hmm.